So um, I'm going to start this talk off with um, a video. There, it's really academic, so pay close attention, take notes. It's, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about it after. It's, um, it's made up of multiple clips of things that are really important to my practice. So again, pay very close attention. Okay, now I have to remember how to get this to play. Oh, that's a giveaway. That's a scholar. Professor Jackson. Good morning and welcome to Wake Up Miami. Today, women who live together. Does society make it tougher? We'll find out when we talk to four lesbians. Today, <laughs> Rosen Island, every man I know is watching this show, this live show, this live show about lesbian lovers of Miami. <laughs> every man you know is watching? Hey, we could beat the prices right. Rose, we can't kill you here because there are cameras. <laughs> now, how did this happen? Oh, I don't know. They just said they wanted two women who loved each other and slept together. <laughs> Do not sleep together. Yes, you did. Last month when, when Blanche was having her room repainted because the plaster behind her headboard all fell out. We're back in 30 seconds, ladies. We're back. Let's meet our panelists. Dorothy, our lesbian. <laughs> Blanche, another lesbian. Image consultants. How come they're not lesbians? We don't believe in labels.
and welcome to Wake Up Miami. Today, somehow you got the longer clip. But anyway, I'm sure you didn't mind that Janet moment. So we saw many clips um, of different music videos and a clip from the Golden Girls. And um, I'll start with MTV as like the umbrella, um, the all important MTV umbrella. So um, I grew up at a time where MTV was just music. And I didn't have MTV, but my grandfather would tape two hours of it for me and I would study it every weekend. Um, and I learned so much from MTV. So MTV was the teacher of all things formative about sex, um, seduction, art, fashion. Um, and I revered it for what it talked to me, taught me about what I call music video logic. And the logic of music video is that anything and anything can be true. So yes, there's a fan, there's wind blowing um, on the inside of the room. Yes, you're going to uh, make up with your partner through like a dance off. There's no reason why Whitney Houston shouldn't be opening up like 20 different colored doors. There's just no reason why. We trust this. We believe it to be true. And I think because we believe it to be true, the music video itself can really introduce many things that are reflected in culture. And so what I received from that um, were really complicated and confusing radical messages. On one hand, I received where does culture seat power? So we get have these beautiful thin women, um, we get to see the rich, the cishet ideas of romance, but at the same time we have these kind of complicated ideas of feminism, of queerness, um, we have Madonna strip teasing while also pantomime shooting you in your, in your face as you're viewing her. We have Grace Jones kind of holding this eye contact, this really arresting eye contact where she says something like, um, my sex life fascinations, wait, I have the quote here, let me find this. She says, um, oh, right, your sex life complications are not my fascinations. And so what I think is interesting here is that there's this overlapping of feminist and queer messages that are celebrated and invalidated in the same medium. And I think MTV was mostly unconscious of this, but also at times conscious. And I think we see those moments mostly in people like Grace Jones and Madonna. And the other thing about early music videos that I really loved is how much they exposed the art direction. So in so many of these videos, we can really see, I mean, that's in the Laura Branigan video, that really is just tinfoil on the floor. And somehow we are accepting that this is this other world, that this is the night world. Um, and also, you know, for Janet, as we see here, yes, that's a, that's, those are chairs, that's uh, some kind of like counter, but the rest is really just painted. And so it, it exposed for me this idea of our direction, uh, the phoniness of things that we can accept as real and really celebrate. Um, and then onto my heroes of Miami, uh, Blanche, Dorothy, Rose, and Sophia. I mean, they still are just such an exciting thing for me to return to and a deep well of inspiration. At the time, I didn't realize what they were doing for me, but they were really helping me develop a queer ethos of chosen family. And they had such an attitude of sex positivity, um, subversive humor. And we all know now that the writers were queer, but at the time, these women are playing this kind of performative heterosexuality within these tensions that sort of give into and then disavow queerness. Um, and it really just confused and delighted me. And um, now I realize that they were modeling for me what I understand as camp, which again, as a kid, you don't know these things. You don't realize there's like academic theories involved in this. But I understood that there was something in me that really resonated with these beautiful women. So um, I know a lot of people when they talk about the 90s and they talk about camp, they kind of reference more like Pee Wee Herman. But for me, these are my gods of camp. Um, and I realize that they also follow a lot of what our author, Philip Kaur, says are the definitive camp rules. The same is true for music videos. I won't read all of these, but I will read some. So camp is a disguise that fails. Camp is a biography written by the subject as if it were about another person. Camp is a character limited to context. This next one, I think, is music video logic. Camp is free association. Free thinking is not camp. And then the one that I think hit me as a young one, was camp is not necessarily homosexual. Anyone or anything can be camp, but it takes one to know one. And so I learned these lessons from, um, in camp from MTV, from the Golden Girls, and furthermore, 
the Golden Girls really showed me the importance of making visible the desire that women above the age of 60 have, and that desire can be um, invisible to culture or deemed invisible to culture, but that desire could be for friendship, it could be for sex, for love, um, and also I learned these things from the proximity of my own life with my mother, my grandmother, and their community around them. So I'm going to give you like a few biographical snapshots that provide insight to how um, I ended up making the work that I do. So I was raised in South Florida, Miami, which kind of says a lot about my aesthetics, I think. Um, from six months to 12 years old, as you heard in my introduction, I was an unsuccessful child model. And success really wasn't part of the game for me or my mother, right? I didn't have a stage mom, but I think we decided together somehow, or she decided for me, this was the dream. And also we just played pretend together. So I really loved faking enthusiasm for soup I'd never tasted or pretending that this doll in my hand is the ultimate doll that I could ever receive. Um, and I also really was interested in pretending to be an age that I wasn't. I was often pretending to be seven, pretending to be five, and you know, it would just be like, put on pigtails, you're younger, put your hair back, you're older. And so learning kind of about identity in that way, I think was really formative. Um, I came out as queer at 17, I cut off all my hair, my grandmother owned a wig shop and started sending me wigs. I don't know if she realized that I intentionally cut off my hair. Um, but I used the wigs to, and a fake ID to sneak into my first drag show. Then at the same year, I went to massage school and I ended up working as a massage therapist for like 15 years, which is how I got through undergrad and um, learned a lot about the body, which works a lot if you're gonna be a figurative painter someday. Um, and then at 18, I lived in a converted barn um, on the land of the massage school teacher that I had. And this land was considered a trans-inclusive, lesbian, separatist, eco-feminist space, which is really uh, quite radical for that time, which I won't tell you the year, but it was in the late 90s. Um, and then from 19 to 21, I performed as an amateur drag king. I wasn't great, but I was really invested in, in the culture and the scene that I was in in Miami. Um, and also my grandmother got really interested in the fact that I was doing drag, and so she would come with me to brunches and to daytime drag shows. And so um, I think lots of people always say, well, how do you get your mom or your grandmother to perform with you? And I think this might help explain a little bit of how and why I make this work. So I went to the museum school, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And when I was there for undergrad, I read everything I could on queer and feminist interpretations of Freud and psychoanalysis. And it was there that I began approaching those Freudian theories from a variety of different queer perspectives, working with my mother and my grandmother. I, I do like to show early work. I won't embarrass myself and show that work, um, but I do have one friend in the audience who knows it, and I see him laughing right now. Um, <laughs> so I started working with my, my family in this time, and um, by the end of undergrad, I started casting women from what I considered my extended family, specifically the women that I grew up with who were friends with my grandmother and my mother. So when I graduated from museum school, I moved back to Miami so that I could be around some of these women more. Uh, and I was looking to meet more women in their community that I didn't know from, from my childhood. Um, so I asked if I could hold a creative meeting. That's all I said. And my grandmother's best friend, Doris, decided to host the meeting. And you can see here, Doris made snacks. And the meeting was to discuss the beginning of a painting series that I wanted to call Entertainment for Men. So this is as far back as I'll show you. And I do want to say, since you're students, I think what's interesting to me when I, when I teach and also um, when I think about putting together a slideshow, I think it's really interesting to find the threads that continue throughout one's work. And so mine are pretty obvious, and that's not true for everyone, but I think you know what you're making now can really lead to what you're making when you're giving artist talks. So I think there's an interesting thread that I like to, to hold for you all. So uh, now here's a picture of my grandmother doing what I asked them to do at the meeting, which went over way better than I thought it would. Um, so I was asking them to kind of look through this series of inherited Playboy magazines. The series was um, from the first year that I was born to the 13th year of my life. And I think being a room full of Jewish grandmothers, they really loved that this was a nod to Judaism. Um, so they were like, okay, great. We see, we see the, the link here. We'll, we'll do, you've convinced us we'll do this. So they each kind of looked through Playboy. And what I asked them to do was find the, the seduction tactic, um, either on the front of the magazine or on the inside of the magazine, that resonated with them in some way. Did it turn them on? Did it make them uncomfortable? Did it inspire them? Did it disappoint them? Um, and so in some way, I wanted them to choose this to reenact. 
And I let them know, I'll get, I'll fill the studio, we'll recreate this, we'll get the props, we'll, I'll have hair and makeup, which was a huge exciting thing for them. And you know, they decided to call it their full Dietrich, so whenever one of them did a, a photo shoot with me, they would then plan a dinner with the others so they could come back and kind of make a grand entrance. And so it became a, a little performance that we did for each other. Every now and then I would host more than one of them in the studio to do this photo shoot. So. Again, I'm not going to focus on this series, but I will go through it pretty quickly. I was interested in what happened with these women who essentially uh, raised me on some level and, and what would happen if I was asking them to, to direct this kind of like sexuality for me. And most interesting to me was what they chose and if that seduction tactic had somehow been present my whole life or was it completely unpresent. Um, and so this is my grandmother, we called her Mum. -um, so I titled this painting Entertainment for Men is a series, and this is Mum -um as July 1982. And these are um, small, I mean it's even weird to see them that big, they're really the size of the magazine. And that was intentional because I wanted them to feel like something very familiar that you could pass around. If they chose a centerfold it would be 11 by 17, and these are 8.5 by 11. Um, okay. Did my mother and grandmother chose the same one, which I thought was pretty amazing. This is Irene, another grandma best bestie. This is Barb as 1988. This is my mom as page 57, September 1992. And we did, in fact, fill the studio with hay, which is not something I suggest. Okay, this is uh, Toby is page 97 in 85 and Ronnie page 41 in 1990. Okay, so I've been talking about references. I started this off with music videos and the Golden Girls and I stay true to those being my main references. But it wasn't until like um, a year ago I gave a talk just like this and I started talking about another reference kind of off the cuff in a question and it has changed the way that I talk about my work. It, I realize now that actually uh, the origin of my impulse to reenact and remake um, and adapt goes back before MTV and before the Golden Girls to the first adaptation that really caught my interest, which was The Wizard of Oz and the Wiz. And I watched this as a child over and over and over and over again. And so I realize now that it planted this idea about how one can take important or valued works and rework them to better address things that have been overlooked or unrepresented in the original. So if you don't mind, I'm going to show you a minute and a half of back-to-back -back moments within The Wizard of Oz and The Wiz. And the last moment is The Emerald City. And I just want to say, trust me, I'm an expert. This is the best cinematic moment in history. If anyone tells you anything differently, they are wrong. Nothing has, better has ever been made than The Wiz, Emerald City. Okay, again, I have to remember how to do this. There we go. To what? To what? We come to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. We hear he is the wizard of wiz, if ever a wiz there was. If ever, oh, ever a wiz there was, the wizard of Oz is one because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. Oh, 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 and a couple of troll-la-laws. That's how we are the day away in the video. 
they go on through the whole rainbow. So there's like eight minutes of this scene, and I, you won't see anything better. Okay. Okay. So getting back to the way in which this relates to my work. So um, again, I'll I'll mention an undergrad work. I won't show you this work. My friend Kobe will laugh because he knows the work. Um, okay, so while I was painting Entertainment for Men, I was also working on some pretty low production videos, but it was my introduction to video work. Um, and they were exploring this idea of cinematic remakes by having the same cast that I was just discussing, my grandmother's friends, my mother's friends, um, perform seduction scenes, this time not through Playboy, but through cinematic history. And so I would, sh I would ask them what movie, um, inspired their seduction tactics, then everyone would perform them. So here's just side by side um, Gilda, and then the performance of Gilda, and then this moment in, uh, gosh, what is that movie called? Pretty Woman, thank you. Um, and then this moment where I'm not even wearing pantyhose, then everyone performed that. And if you don't know that scene, again, check that out. So um, I was making that work, and somebody introduced me to something called the Scopatone film, which truly changed the trajectory of my practice. Um, I had recognized the word scopatone from Susan Sontag's um, essay, Notes on Camp, but I never looked into it. She doesn't say much about them, and so it didn't catch my eye as something I should really like pay attention to. Um, but I immediately realized that scopatones are true camp masterpieces um, and became fully obsessed, and I still am. So the thing about Scopatone films is that they exist as a film and as a machine. And so they're considered, the films are considered precursors to contemporary music video. Um, but in the 60s, these machines were in nightclubs and you would go just as you would a jukebox, put your money in, choose your film. It was film actually being projected inside the screen. Um, and they'd show you these three minute Scopatone films. So uh, what I've done is I've made a four minute video, uh, and I, I like to tell you the time so you're not like antsy. So it's a four minute video uh, made up of three different clips from Scopatone films, the original Scopatone films. And they happen to also be the first three Scopatone films that I remade in my series. So you'll see um, Neil Sadaka's Calendar Girl, then you'll see Joy Lansing's Silencer and Julie London's Daddy.
Hey, Daddy. I want a diamond ring, bracelets, everything, Daddy. You ought to get the best of me. Daddy G. Oh, I look swell in sables, clothes with Paris labels, Daddy. You ought to get the best of me. Here's an amazing revelation with a bit of stimulation. I'd be a great sensation. I'd be your inspiration, Daddy. I want a brand new car, champagne, Daddy R. Daddy, you ought to get the best of me. Okay, so I titled my remake of Scopatone's um, Visual Pleasure Jukebox Cinema as a nod to the feminist film critic Laura Mulvey's essay from 1973, uh, Visual Pleasure Narrative Cinema. And if you haven't read this, the, the biggest takeaway is that this is where the term male gaze was pushed into consciousness. Um, and it was really kind of a, a, an essay about feminist film critique through a psychoanalytic framework. And I was pretty into it as an undergrad. Um, okay, so for the remakes, I make the costumes, the props, the sets, and they're all inspired by the original. So you can see here a side by side. Um, and I commission a queer musician to make a cover of each of the Scopatone songs. And I usually choose that musician based off of the work I already know about them. And so I'm not a musician and I don't speak a, a, a great musical language. Luckily, since then, I've, my wife is a musician, so she's helped me, but I've been making these before her. So I would just say, like, make it bouncy and, you know, sparkly. And they're like, that's not actually musical terminology. It's like, figure it out. You know what I mean. So anyway, I got really lucky. Um, and a lot of these uh, musicians were able to perfectly, perfectly get the, the feeling I wanted. So um, the other thing that happened in the making of this is I expanded beyond just my extended family um, as an attempt to sort of queer this family uh, of, of characters into including uh, trans and cis women from the queer community that I'm a part of. So people that are elders in my queer community. And... In each of these remakes, my mother is in them, often playing a leading role. Here you can see the side-by-side -side daddy. So I'm going to play uh, a three-minute edit of two videos, Daddy and Silencer.
so uh, for the first cover, um, Daddy was made by Justin Vivian Bond, and the second cover, the song, was made by Steph Taylor. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the technology. So um, by the early 70s, this technology was pretty much obsolete. And there's many different theories about why. One of them truly involves the mob, which I haven't really looked all that into. Um, others are just about uh, popularity. And I kind of think about this ever popular jukebox. You know, you put the money in and you go and you dance. I am so, every single time something plays, I have the temptation to dance here because I usually give talks in like tiny basements of schools and this feels like, so anyway, you put the money in and then you go do the jukebox dances, right? But the Scopatone really asked you to kind of huddle around a screen. For a long time, I envisioned that meaning a very small screen. I've only had the glory of seeing a Scopatone in real life one time, and it actually was so powerful and such an amazing, imposing machine. But um, I do think there's something about being separated from the dance floor, separating from community. Now we're used to that, right? We're just going to sit on our phone at a party anyway. Why even invite us? But at the time, that was not the case. And so I believe that maybe the Scopatone kind of lost some popularity. I also think that these were just so campy and though they were reflecting a sort of performative heteronormativity, they really, no one was fooled. No one was fooled when the like love interest guy comes in and he's like, <laughs> you know, that's not really fooling anyone. So, um, so anyway, those are some of my understandings around Scopatone's failure, but I'm, I'm, I, I don't know for sure. But for me, they're really prime, um, prime things to remake and to queer. And also for this thing that I'm talking about, this idea of isolation, this idea of separation from community, I was really interested in ways that I can make the viewing experience hold community to be kind of like um, a juicy, like sensual experience that you can, that includes touch, that includes like a lot of senses. And so this was actually the thesis show that I made um, for my MFA at Columbia. Um, and I titled the installation Jukebox Cinema, which I've now remade many times over. So I'll show you a couple of the, the remakes of this installation and the different iterations that they've, that they've um, made. So um, a few years later, a curator in the Netherlands asked if they could put this in a, in a show. And um, right when we started planning this and kind of building it, COVID was kind of in full force. And so... The restriction actually was that um, I'm no longer able to make a space for community. I'm making a space for one or two people. This was in 2020 to enter. But yet I hoped that that still allowed people to feel this kind of enveloping feeling um, of something other than desperation. <laughs> um, This was my favorite video uh, image that was sent to me. The, the Netherlands, they're really pretty radical and cool. I mean, I get more images of kids watching these like sexy BDSM scenes. And in, uh, in contrary to what happened here at my museum show, it, not even just children, but if cis men walked in the room, they'd walk right out. And if there were kids, it'd be like blocking their eyes. Like the kid would be so attracted to all the glitter and the excitement and the pink, but the parents were really upset about it. So um, this was the third iteration of this installation, and it was the first time that I had like proper institutional support. So it allowed me to really expand the vision more. And so when we were designing the entrance, I was lucky enough to pull from all these references and have a team larger than me with more money than I am capable of pull together um, ways to kind of bring all of the influences together. So here was, um, a inspiration board that I sent to them. I wanted um, 1980s peep show references from Times Square, and I really am obsessed with flash dance, and so I really wanted to be thinking about the flash dance um, strip club. So this is what we came up with. You can see there's a, there's a, a neon or faux neon sign that you can see through the room. Um, you enter in a, a heart or a butt or a dance floor, however you choose to see it. Um, and we wanted to kind of signal to this kind of 80s peep show aesthetic. So you walk into this, um, My Heart's in the World um, is the name of the show that's, that lyric's taken from um, the, the Neil Sedaka cover song. Um, and then in this case, I was able to have my dream come true, which was to um, access uh, 
romance resort heart-shaped hot tub and bring it into the museum. Um, and what more can I say? I mean, that's just like the goal. I don't know what I don't know what happens from here, folks, but the goal has, the goal was hit. Um, and then you'll see embedded in the walls. There's other videos, and those videos are mostly of the tinsel, and then there'll be body parts kind of moving throughout the tinsel. So in that way, I was thinking about creating a peep show that sometimes is happening and sometimes isn't happening. Um, the goal was to have uh, queer elders in my community, but at this point, this was still COVID, or of course, I think it is still COVID, but um, at this moment, it was the kind part of COVID where we were completely isolated from one another. So um, that didn't happen in the way that I wanted. But here's another image. This is, you might remember Doris, who held the initial creative meeting to look at the Playboy magazines. This is Doris performing in my cover of Calendar Girl. And this is the opposite side of the room. And one thing I was able to do, because this is a museum, I was thinking um, a little bit more educationally than I might think in just a regular gallery show. So on the opposite side, you could walk back into that room, the darker room, and you'd see uh, a, a version of a Scopatone machine. And in that case, I was playing the original three so that you could experience both the, the, the remakes and the originals. Um, and I think this is a video. Well, it, it doesn't have good sound if it is, but let's see. Is it? No, it is not. Okay. So then I've continued to make some of these um, versions of this, of a similar installation. So this was in uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands. This is in Korea. Oh, and I don't have, I'm sorry, I didn't put the recent show up. Um, but there's a beautiful pink one up right now at the Arnheim Museum. Okay, so keeping with this idea of community and reenacting things from 1960s pop culture, um, I'm gonna show you the other really important reference to my work, and this is the series of paintings that I'm working on now. Um, so I turned to Slim Aaron's photographs because they share a similar preoccupation with youth and leisure and uh, white bikini-clad rich women kind of just having their time. And again, similar to Scopatones, I find that to be a really fraught place that's complicated because on one hand, we're sort of told this, these are aspirational goals. And on the other hand, there's so many things in there that are worth remaking, commenting on, or erasing. Um, and so what I wanted to do with this, this series was make um, paintings that reference these photographs. Now, at one point, Slim Aaron said about his photography that he makes uh, photos about attractive people doing attractive things in attractive places. And so I named my painting this exact quote. Um, so my, my painting series is called uh, Attractive People Doing Attractive Things in Attractive Places, but what I wanted to do was revise Aaron's vision, repopulating the poolsides with a queer vision of what attractive people look like and to suggest the attractive things they might do. Um, and so when applicable, I will also alter the architecture or the art found in the original. So sometimes I might swap out mansions for cabins, cottages, or beach houses that were once advertised in queer archives as um, safe places for people to vacation. Again, a little bit less applicable to the way we live now, but I guarantee you that if you were even 10 years or 15 years uh, living 15 years ago, you would still see people needing to go find like safe, hidden queer uh, cabins so that they can like really be with, um, with their community. So unlike the Entertainment for Men series, I wanted the painting to not be conflated with something accessible and small and easy to handle. I really wanted to think about these, these images kind of being really large and, and encompassing the viewer. And um, so I was also um, working in, when I was in New York, I was working as an Alzheimer's caretaker for this woman and we would go to the Frick every day. And Luckily for me, she was a big fan of the Fragonard Room, and I too am a big fan of the Fragonard Room. And so I really was thinking a lot about these paintings and the scale of these paintings, and also how these paintings might have been a similar reference if I was born at another time, right? Thinking again about uh, the way that this um, reflects culture's interest in wealth, in whiteness, in youth. Um, and yet, like all of the references that I am drawn to, I still find quite beautiful. And that complication always interests me. So Fragonard is something for me that is, is really interesting. And I was also thinking a lot about um, 
Bosch's garden of earthly delights. Um, not only in scale, but like color palette and debaucherous content, fun content, flowers coming out of the butt content. Um, and so by remaking these images from the 60s, and when I say images, I mean images and video, um, I'm again attempting to like revise these things that were really vibrant during my mother's adolescence. And I think about that a lot, like what does that mean if we can go back and kind of create like a different relationship to to queerness um, through the things that were inspiring generations before us. So in this case, I was also looking at like what what is like wealth aspiration and also, you know, um, okay, I'm, I'm choosing to not go on a rant about uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. But what I do want to say is, you know, we think a lot about uh, cl class aspiration and I think the way queerness used to, uh, at one point, would play with class as class camp, as sort of per, uh, pretending and critiquing at the same time issues of capitalism. I worry now that things like RuPaul's Drag Race may have kind of just made everybody just want to be rich and wealthy and kind of like, like, like lure their money over other people. But I do think that at the same time, um, we can still look to these references as a way to critique capitalism and in this way though I am working within these like affluent settings I'm really thinking about a way for us to kind of look at what that means about culture and leisure and social capital and so um, I like to think like what ha what does it mean that these women may own this mansion and what does it mean that like there's giant sex parties happening in the backyards um, or have these women just kind of like stormed that's a hard word to use now after January 6th, but you know what I mean. Have they like taken over the castle? And, uh, and if they've taken over the castle, now it's a location for pleasure. Um, and it brings to mind something that a different author, uh, expert on camp, named Mark Booth said in his book, Camp Toy, The Origins and Definitions of Camp. I love this quote. He said, of course, Louis XIV did not build Versailles with the intention of making it camp, but... Like peasants after a revolution, camp people have camped out in the palace. They have overrun the legend of Versailles and converted it to camp. Versailles stands in the camp memory, not as it was intended, as a symbol of decorative absolutism, but as a symbol of absolute decorativism. So in a way, I'm attempting to retroactively make these fantasy history paintings and a fantasy history that could point to a fantasy present, one that includes you know, trans-inclusive lesbian spaces, inclusive of, a of age, of race, and doing so with these materials and the people that are available to me. So, like the video work, I've placed my mother in a lot of these paintings. My grandmother appears sometimes twice in the paintings. This is my mother. I'm calling her the house mother in this case, um, thinking about, you know, kind of a history of the house mothers in strip clubs and in the drag world. Um, and I'm also very strict about who gets invited to these painted parties. So to make these paintings, I start off with a Slim Aaron's photograph, and then I make a mock-up. Um, and this mock-up is compiled of an image database that I've been compiling for years now that has thousands of porn imagery. Um, and I, you know, so, some of the images I've taken, uh, my grandmother's no longer alive, but because I was making work with her when I was in undergrad, I have so many pictures of her from that time that I can put in. This is my grandmother here. Oh, wait, no even cooler. <laughs> this is my grandmother here. Now I feel like a real professor. <laughs> okay, I don't have this where I teach. I need to get one. Um, okay, so um, she's, she's often like three or four times. I mean, people like play like a Where's Waldo with my grandmother often. Um, so some of the images come from my own photos that I've taken. Some of them come from Facebook or fetish sites. Some of them come from Googling, you know, granny lesbian porn or, or trans-inclusive lesbian softball team, 65 and up, like random Google searches that sometimes provide exactly what I'm looking for and often provide absolutely not what I'm looking for, like peeing in the bushes, grandma caught, like it just, anyway. So, so that's where a lot of these images come from. And then, um, like I said, often I will switch out uh, a piece of architecture or, or um, a piece of art so here's the reference for a painting that I called 1-800-Flowers. And to me, this was such a beautiful giant lawn that was being used in a very unsatisfying way to my, to my belief. So I wanted to make it way more fun, way more interesting. 
Um, this is my, oh, yes, okay. This is my Bosch reference with the flower in the butt. Um, but this thing here, if you remember, there was this big, big, huge house, and instead what I wanted to do was replace it again. Oh, yes, yay, see? Okay, replace it with um, a cabin that I found that was in an, a, a lesbian archive um, of a discreet place for lesbians to vacation in the 80s. And so I think it was in Maine. But this place no longer exists, and so as a way to kind of nod towards its lack of existence, I also wanted to kind of cover it over, grow, grow over um, with the land itself. So this is called 1-800-Flowers. And here's a close-up and a detail, another detail. And also these paintings um, are kind of like another way for me to kind of unabashedly love mannerism, and particularly this painting by, uh, called The Visitation by Pontormo. And there's a lot of ways in which I think about this painting or other mannerist paintings when I'm placing groups of people together. Um, most of the time, nobody in my paintings know one another. Like, often I'm not finding a scene where these people are together. I often have to make that. Uh, that I mean, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, they aren't. So when I'm doing that, I'm, I, I am always kind of thinking about mannerism. This is called Are You Thirsty? And it's called Are You Thirsty? Because the orange soda at the time, that was kind of the the cheeky, sexy girl on the commercial kind of asking you, are you thirsty, baby? Um, okay, so this is, the, this is an opportunity for me to explain um, switching out the artwork, and then I'm almost done. I think I'm about at time. But if you see here, in the middle, there's this sculpture. I don't know who made this sculpture, but we've all seen sculptures of such. Does anyone, does this, does this look like anyone to you? Okay, I don't know who made this. But, um... I'm in front of so many brilliant minds, I thought, at my desk. So for me, it was very clear that I was taking this out and putting in an Anne Truitt. Let me show you the Anne Truitt. Okay, so right? How perfect. The colors, the size, and also it being made at a very similar time. So this Anne Truitt piece was made um, in the 70s, uh, around the same time this photograph was taken. And so for me, when I, when I put in... Um, uh, a piece of artwork that's made by either a woman or a queer person, I'm also finding, and you know, that's my other way to kind of challenge Slamarans around this idea of like what the attractiveness of this location and the attractiveness of what his people are doing. Um, okay, here's another Slim Aaron's, and then this is, uh, I called this piece Making Fruit Punch, and the reason I called it that was that I was working on a detail, like a, just working on this part. And I sent a picture to my lifelong best friend who has some kids. And her daughter said, um, Mom, is she making fruit punch? So I was like, wow, that is a better title than I would have ever come up with. <laughs> okay, I'll just kind of go through these. This is called Are You Happy Baby? I don't do yoga, but someone told me that that's like a yoga pose called Happy Baby. So I decided to call it Are You Happy Baby? Um, Jen, does this look familiar to you? Jen's in the audience, you, might, you all might know her, but Jen helped me um, prepare for my show um, and helped me, helped me get this painting together. So this is called deck work, and deck work is a synchronized swimming term that I learned five minutes before naming this painting, which was two hours before delivering the painting to the gallery. <laughs> and deck work is a term for synchronized swimmers whenever they perform on the deck before, before entering or after um, exiting the pool. This painting I called Constant Craving because I felt like the, the tree to the, to the right was kind of swaying to the Katie Lang song, Constant Craving. Like everything else had its own rhythm, but that one tree was Constant Craving It Up. Who knows that song? Who wants to sing that song? Anybody? No? Okay. Okay, so let me just show you. We're going to end here with just some install shots of um, my most recent show at Candace Mady Gallery, just so you can have an idea of scale. And I think we're, I think we hit the okay time. Taylor, am I, am I okay? Okay. Okay, good. Great. That's the last one. Thank you so much. So I believe that now is the time for questions if you have any. Um, and I, I'm expecting lots of questions about the music videos. Yeah. I have a question, but it's so interesting like, seeing how these things come about because a lot of what you're like, listening to the beginning is so similar to like, the things that like, inspired me so much. Because like, I was raised by my grandma, so we watched so much Golden Girls. Ah, yes. And I also I've watched like, a lot of like, Golden Girls. Like, I've watched a lot of Golden Girls. 
Oh, I know. It sounds like it. Maybe we have the same grandma. No, my grandma's no longer alive. I mean, I've, I've had two grandmothers, but neither of them are alive. Um, well, I, I hear that there's not a question in there, but I really like what you're sharing with me. But one thing I will say, from the perspective of, of now someone who's had like several uh, hundred students, and I have to talk to them often about where their work comes from, I think that um, one thing I'm really interested in is that you really care about where your work comes from and it, that you don't put the pressure on yourself for it to like save the world. But if it kind of like does something for you or it is like your most interesting space or your bravest place or your like the place where you can be exercising some of the, the more interesting parts of yourself, I'm more interested in that than I am someone trying to have a statement that's going to kind of fix something. I think just like, you know, so, so, so yeah, I'm curious what you're making. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the way in sometimes is through the thing you care about the most. And that will reveal other things you care about. I mean, of course, I, I do not discredit the sort of political statements that the work's making. But I think I can only arrive there through the things that interest me or through humor or through camp or through f something that's fun to me. Um, and so, you know, I encourage other, uh, particularly students that are in, uh, artists that are in school, to think about the things that really matter to them. Yeah. That's a great question. I didn't. I don't know how. I don't know why. I thought I thought some of them were going to leave. Okay, so the question was, did I have to persuade anyone to do the work? So no, not in that. You, you particularly asked about that meeting, and I will happily say no. But I will let you in on a little secret, which is everyone thinks that, um, that my work must mean that my mother and I are... Um, besties that we hang out every day and that you know every day is a is a party where we're dressing up and that's just not true and and um my mom doesn't like sometimes like i just um crashed a business trip that my mom was on um and i so we spent a lot of time with her in, in cancun and so we were you know I, she was in her bathing suit and i was like oh this is perfect you know i don't have any i need to update and she was like everything is not you know a moment for you to take a picture of me and i was like but okay Okay, really? Like, and so the thing is, is that she's not, you know, not necessarily uh, an, an, an extrovert person. These things don't come that easy to her. She doesn't always love being in them. She consents to being in them. She, she, she basically raised me to think about being an artist, to, to, to enjoy art, to prioritize art. And so, you know, sometimes I'll say, well, I mean, you made me this way, so you know, come on, let's do, you know. But I think that, you know, there, my grandmother never needed to be persuaded. My mother does it because she wants to, you know, assist in my practice, but she's not like dying to do the next video. She said she'll do one more video. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Is this in Philadelphia? Or no, this show is in, um, it's, no, it's no longer up, but it was at Candace Mady in the Lower East Side in New York. Okay, I think I saw two hands at the exact same time, but I, I believe I saw yours one second first. So we'll go to you and then, and then you. Um, I love the way you talk about like depicting well as both like, both like critiquing it and um, like making fun of the problems with it. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I also feel like that's been like lost in a lot of like art in general. I, I'm personally, I like, It's like the 70s or the 80s but like the drag house scene I kind of was fascinated by that and me and my mom like watched a lot of documentaries and like shows depicting that type of thing but um like what would you say like going forward would help you like 
critique those things. Like, mm. that's, a, that's a hard question. I can't really put it into words, but, you know, obviously they had something there, but it was like, like, just like you said, now it's kind of like people actually do just want to become rich as... Yes, I totally know what you're saying. I mean, uh, I see such a switch in culture. You know, every generation kind of looks back and goes, oh, in my day. But I think what I'm seeing now with, like, the, the Instagram influencer, it's like, you know, most of my students to have the, the goal is to have a brand kind of, like, support them, which absolutely was not present in the art world at all even just 10 years ago. And so there, it's dangerous, I think, to, to live with the aspirations of like that particular kind of wealth or a particular kind of support. And also to create this idea that that is like, the, you know, the audience that, that is most valuable or worth being seen from. So I don't know exactly how to answer your question of how would I continue to critique that particular complication. But I guess the answer is, you know, I don't know what each video is going to, all the work is kind of like an umbrella where I'm shoving all these ideas in and one painting or one video might get more of one idea than the other. And so, you know, uh, like I have a, a future video coming up that takes place in a, in a, like a renovated dollhouse. And so for me, I think there's like a lot of fun in the idea of kind of poking at all these kind of like this desire to have like the the most elegant home or the most like but but it, and that will all be present but it'll be like the size that one could never actually enter if I'm not green screening you in so I don't know if that's the right answer to your question but I think I myself am still figuring out different ways to work that content in when I first started making this work though I did have friends be like oh you know you can't really critique capitalism within like a setting as opulent as this. And I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna try. And and maybe to some I'm doing it right and maybe to some I'm doing it wrong, but I don't, this is my, per, the way I'm personally choosing to explore those ideas. And many people are gonna have, you know, ways that they think accurate, you know, do it more accurately or like more successfully. But this is how, again, staying true to the things that are interesting to me, you know, I'm really interested in these like things that we deem aspirational and problematic at the same time and the way that culture kind of like will will kind of turn their eye to something if it's like you know from the I mean in my in my 20s I didn't know a single person that would wear Nikes because it was like Nikes they're the worst like they do sweatshops and this and that and 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 I think everybody that felt that way probably owns 10 now because somehow that branding has changed and that's hopefully not true but do you know what I mean? So I think I'm still kind of working with those ideas. Okay. Hopefully I got there somewhere with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, has a model ever, like, backed out last minute? Yeah, actually, I did have a model back out, but not for, like, um, a reason of rethinking it, but more because they had, um, uh, they, they broke their leg. <laughs> and so... Yeah, so I did have a model back out, but I ended up, you know, fi filling filling in the space. But uh, I wish I had a more interesting question uh, answer for that question. But that is the, that is the reason. I've had things fall through. I mean, things fall through whenever you're working with other people, which is why so many artists like it's so much easier to work with yourself. And that's like that's why I think a lot of artists end up working with them their own image because it's a lot easier. Um, or I don't think that's the only reason why, but I think there is a benefit to that reason. Um, however, uh, when I sign up to work with like 12 women over the age of 70, I know that that means we have to be flexible. Any other questions? Yeah. So when you're talking about like the scope of tone, like did it have like sort of a second life as like a fringe, kind of, or not like a fringe, but like more explicitly, yeah, I guess like That is such a good question. Well, okay, I don't know because I wasn't there, but um, what I do know is that there are so few people that care about scopatones now that when I met with um, the the film curator at the MoMA is a big scopatone fan, and that's why he he owns a scopatone machine, 
And when I met with him, he said, um, oh, do you know, and I'm making up a name right now because I don't remember this person's name, but he was like, do you know Johnny so-and-so? So and, so? and I said, no, I, what, what, how would I? Oh, he knows you because he's really into scope tones. I mean, I think it's like, if you, if you love them, then you like have a notification. Like anytime like my artist statement goes up on the internet, it's like, Samantha's talking about scope tones. However, Philadelphia, we are very lucky because I just found out that there's this, I'm new to Philly, so I'm learning about a lot of things. Um, I don't know how long I can get away with saying I'm new to Philly, but I'm still relatively new to Philly, pandemic what years. So there's something called secret cinema. Maybe you all know about this. I did not. Um, but they're having, in two, on the 24th of February, they're actually having a Scopatone party. And apparently they performed this party 20 years ago and they've done it, I, I, I'm, I'm getting some of the times wrong, but they've done it like five times internationally, sometimes in Spain, in California. Um, and they're doing it again here. And I believe it's like 15 or 20 years after the first time they did it. And so, so, there, so maybe we are seeing a resurgence of Scopatone love, but I am going to go to this event, um, Secret Cinema. They're not paying for me to say this, but anyway, you should go. Yeah. I have two questions. One, uh, do you ever put, put together the paintings and the uh, video installation work? Um, and the second is, um, have you been, is, is John Waters, the work of John Waters important to you? Yeah, I do love the work of John Waters. Um, I love the, 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 I love when aspiration is turned towards filth. I think that like the way that he uses the idea of aspiration is just like really exciting. And I, I love John Waters and I, um, it was another person, John Waters and David Lynch were people that I really studied a lot in undergrad and, and really loved. Um, to answer your first question, the only time I was ever able to show both at the same time was actually just in my MFA thesis show. That was it. I have, for the show in, in the in Boston in, at the museum, there was an iteration where I thought it might be possible, but I have not yet been given enough space to make that happen. But I think the relationship, and mostly it's because what happens in the room needs to be dark for the scope of tone and then you need the light and that, that negotiation. But I, do, I think conceptually, and I even think visually, there's a beautiful way that I have many a drawing of um, to kind of bring both of those worlds together. So fingers crossed that someday I get to like fully have that happen. It's a different painting, but yes. Oh, it's a different painting. So that's actually, I, oh wow, I wish I had this up to show you. The surprise about that one is that it's all miniature. So yeah, so this was a really exciting thing. When the pandemic first started, there was a gallery in Boston. Um, every, you know, people were laid off, or not laid off, what was it called when you were, you were out of work during the first part. And so um, uh, someone in the museum, like the fabrication part of the museum, created a gallery for artists to conceive large vision, but at a tiny scale. So that painting is actually 10 inches by 14 inches, but it looks like it's 10 feet by 14 feet. And then I made an inflatable out of Ziploc bags <laughs> and paint and bubble wrap on the inside. But it, in the photograph, because the gallery is so well done, it even has its little like plugs on the, that it looks like I've made this giant inflatable, but, he was right in that it did create an idea for a vision for a larger thing that I just haven't also, it's another thing that I haven't been able to like make. Um, but that Ziploc inflatable lives in a, in a shoe box in my house. <laughs> but it, I, it's, it's surprising. It's surprising to, uh, to find that out, I think. Yeah, thank you for asking that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do we have time, Taylor, should I? I think one more question. Okay. Yeah. Oh gosh, I saw two hands. I think we can try it. We can try two. Like All right, two more. I just want to know the name of that miniature installation. The miniature gallery? Yeah. It was called Shelter in Place. It was very pandemic forward gallery. Yeah. Well, that's good for this for allowing two. That was a quick one. Yeah, what's your second question? The 
the, there's two authors. Philip Core is one, and Mark Booth is the other. Yeah. And then Susan Sontag, of course. Okay. Thank you all so much.